people. We, we left off last week in chapter 32, and this week we're going to start in chapter 33 and go through the end of the book. I love to say chapter 33, and the highlight of chapter 33 is God's cell number. Hey, you can't hardly see that back there. It should be white. No. should have made that white. But uh, God's cell phone number is Jeremiah 3033. In case you need to call on God. He says, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Great and mighty things which you do not know. You can't read it up here? Look in your Bible. That's what it's for. Underline that one. Underline that one in your Bible. They do I cut one over and put the lights off in front of you. Now, it'll be better after we get past this. But most of them I use white. I didn't use black. I don't know why I left that one <laughs> But uh, it looks better on the computer than it does up there. <laughs> but uh, and, and that's just a great, that's a great verse for us. I we had a theme in a church one time a whole year long. That was call upon God, you know, and God's cell phone number, 33-3. And uh, that's really Jeremiah's challenging the people to call to him. If you haven't been here these last three Sunday nights when we studied this, basically it's about the unfaithfulness of the people because they were worshiping idols and all kind of pagan gods and, and they, just, they had just forsaken God, wouldn't listen to God. And Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet and for 41 years he preached in his ministry. And as far as we know, we see no converts. For 41 years, and he was thrown in jail. He was accused of treason because he wouldn't say what the people wanted him to say. And he fought with the other pro some of the other prophets because they were false prophets. And uh, he was known. He 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 said, "Curse me the day that I was ever born." And uh, you're pretty depressed when that kind of thing happens. And uh, all right, God gives us five wonderful promises to Jeremiah and to any of the people who would truly put their trust. In the Lord. Let's look at some of those promises today. He promised to help and heal the nation. God promised if they would listen to him, they would he would help them. He would heal their nation. You know, a nation can be prosperous and still be sick. America needs some spiritual healing. Amen. God promised to give the people peace and truth or security. You know the word for what He promised them? Verse 6. He said, Behold, I will bring it health uh, and healing. I will heal them and reveal to them the abundance of peace and truth. Number three, he promised that Judah and Israel would the combined kingdoms. Remember, because of their sin, they had they had been divided into two kingdoms. What were the two kingdoms called? North and south. Huh? Israel and Judah, north and south, right? Northern kingdom, southern kingdom. And Israel was the northern kingdom, Judah was the southern kingdom. How many tribes were in the northern kingdom? Ten. Ten. How many was in the southern kingdom? Three. Two. I left two, didn't it? And the main city was Jer Jerusalem, which was in those two down at the bottom, the southern kingdom. I shared with you last week that Israel got taken away captive about 150 years or so earlier. And Judah was taken away captive. Who can tell me what year? That they destroyed the temple. Began, they took them away at some different times, but we go by 586 B.C. 586 B.C. is when they were taken away. And so God says, I'm going to bring y'all back together and I'm going, to put you back, I'm going to rebuild you and put you back in the land. That was the promise. If they would start listening to Him, God promised He'd rebuild all the cities of the restored nation of Israel. Most of them were gone. They had been destroyed. Just to know how you, they, they call something a tale over there. And it's a, where there was a city and those cities get destroyed. They flatten them. And use those rocks basically as a foundation and they build a new city on top of them. And some years later, they'll flatten them again. Somebody will come in there and destroy it and they'll build a new city on top of it. So what starts out at ground level, now the city may be 
three, four hundred feet high, <laughs> higher than it was when it started, because it may have been destroyed and rebuilt eight or ten times. And the new location is, you have to walk up a hill to get to it, because there's several other each cities, just like Jerusalem, you can, you can you dig way down in Jerusalem and see the ruins where it had been destroyed and rebuilt, destroyed and rebuilt. <coughs> All right, and number five, God promises to forgive and cleanse the defiled nation from its sin and rebellion against Him. Cleansing, that's what they needed. That's what Israel needed. 11, chapter 33. Chapter 34 through 36. Jeremiah, this is, break down these next few chapters into Jeremiah's experiences because really here in these three chapters, he backs up to some things that happened earlier. That's four. I had to put my sound on. Does anybody hear me okay in the back? Scott, can you hear me? No. They're doing all right. They said they're good. All right, number five. Number five is to forgive and cleanse the defiled nation. Chapters 34 through 36, he backs up and he begins to talk about some specifics that happened early on in his ministry, before they were taken down as a nation. And then there's a section beginning in chapter 37 where he talks about during the fall, some things that happened during the fall of the nation, and then there's a few chapters that talk about things that happened after the fall of the nation. So that's how the next three sections are broken down, to things that happened before the fall, during the fall, and after the fall. All right? These three chapters deal with Jeremiah's experiences before the fall, some of the things that led up to the fall of the city. Israel's hypocrisy, chapter 34, is condemned. Their hypocrisy, they were, they were pretenders. You know what the word hypocrisy means? It means someone who is pretending. The, in dramas, in old Greek dramas, there would be one person who'd have a smiley face and they'd have a frowny face. And sometimes they'd put one face on and sometimes the other face. And they were a pretender. They were called a hypocrite. And uh, that was the person when one person trying to be two different things. Many Hebrews had sold themselves into slavery, but God had said that, and by the way, that was pretty common in their day. Um, you could, if you couldn't afford to feed your family, or you couldn't, maybe your family couldn't afford to take care of you. You could basically sell yourself to some employer, and it's kind of like being an employee, but a little more liberality there. Uh, they could beat you or whatever, you know. Uh, but God had said that to the Hebrew people that, that every seven years, if you sold yourself in slavery to someone, every seven years you had to set them free. So it wasn't like you could just keep them in slavery forever. Well, they had refused to let their slaves Go. They had refused to follow that law. And God's, when God tells them what they should do and shouldn't do, it's just like we talked about last week. Why did they get sent in exile for 70 years to Babylon? Because for 490 years, they had not honored the sabbatical year, which every seventh year they would have let their land rest. Remember I told you that. And God said after 490 years, He said, you hadn't done it. You hadn't been letting that land rest. And he said, so because of that, you owe me 70 years. And he took it, and he sent them to Babylon. Is that still good for today? You to well, I'm going to tell you this. You plant watermelons in the same spot every, every year, and they'll get less and less sweet. Oh, yeah. 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 If you don't let that land rest and plant somewhere else, that's the same way for pretty much any, any kind of... Uh, item that grows from yeah. the ground. It becomes less and less nutrient the in the but ground. But if you rotate your crops around it, don't make any difference. If I'm you just rotate asking. your crops, yeah. But I don't, we're not under the law anymore. But I think the better part of wisdom would probably say, yeah, rotation. There's a year they, they, had, they were supposed to rotate their crops. This year you rotate that section. 
Next year you, you, you rest that section. This year you rest this section. Next year you rest that section. And that's what God was telling them to do. And that was to be a holy year for God. That ground was to be holy that year. And so, Exodus 21-2, if you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh year he shall go free. Is that and what they call an indentured servant? Yeah, indentured servant, uh, someone that sold themselves as a slave. In fact, they would use some of this. They would put their ear to a door post, and they would drive a stake through their ear oh. and poke a hole in their ear. And that was to show that they were owned. So all you guys putting your rings on, I'm telling y'all, y'all telling somebody your own, and your wife probably does own you. So I understand that, you know, we can do what we're told, amen? But, uh, but anyway, that's what it meant. The hole in your ear, the love of your ear, meant you were owned by someone. I, I think that's right. I think Brother Ray said if, it, if he wanted to keep himself in nature, he didn't have to go free. Uh, that was one of the things, like Paul said, he was a bond slave of Jesus Christ, meaning he chose to make himself. He wasn't sold. He didn't sell. He really sell himself to God, even though Christ paid for our stuff, on, our sins on the cross. Uh, he was willingly made himself a slave. They uh, they bored their ear when they willingly remained <laughs> a slave. They didn't do it when you became an indentured servant. Not when they were bought. But is that was, right, Daniel? No, the Bible says it's uh, if you choose to remain with your master and yeah. be forever theirs, then they would bore your ear. Yeah, that's what they called a bond slave, which was a little different. That's what Paul said he was, bond slave. Bargaining with God. They did a lot of that. Uh, seeking to please God and get His favor. The king proclaims that they must release their slaves. And, and the Babylonian army pulls back in the city. That, so let me tell you the history. I had to kind of shorten that. What had happened, Jeremiah told them, he said, one of the reasons God's punishing us is because you refuse to let your slaves go, just like to release them. And, uh, and, and God's going to punish us one of the reasons because you're being a hypocrite. You're not following God's word. You say one thing. So here's what they said. They said, okay, we'll let the slaves go. And so they let the slaves go and the moment they did that, the Babylonians were already kind of making war sounds. They were already coming upon them. They were building a siege ramp and all that kind of... They were going to be defeated. But when they let their slaves go, honored God, the Babylonian army pulled back because they were fighting with the Egyptians and they had to take this army and move it to Egypt to fight with the Egyptians and to help them because the Egyptians had had partnered up with some of the, the Jewish kings, the king of Egypt, of, uh, of uh, Judah. And he had gone and made a partnership with the king of Egypt. And instead of uh, following God, he went man's way, tried to have another army help him. So the Babylonians pulled out and went over there. The people said, Woo, God let us go. God saved us. God saved us because we're such good believers. And you know what they did? They took those slaves and they put them right back into indenture. <laughs> I mean, the Babylonian army hadn't got out of sight good, and they re-enslaved all their slaves they just let go. And guess what? It took the Babylonians about two years to whip the Egyptians, and they turned around and came right back. <laughs> and there wasn't any relenting. In fact, some said, had they gone through, Jeremiah was talking like, had y'all gone through with that? But you're just hypocrites. You just played the game. You didn't mean it. Hey, folks, we can be hypocrites in church today. Amen. We can come sit in church with no thought of getting right with God. No thought of letting God have His way. No thought of worshiping God. But we're there to impress our wife, or we're there to impress our husband, or we're there to impress mom and dad. And I've actually known people go to certain churches because it would help their business. A lot of wealthy people in those churches. Help their political issues. Yeah, and political issues. Yeah, I remember Bill Clinton up in Little Rock. He, when he started running for governor, he'd get, a, he'd get in the choir and he'd sit right behind the preacher because they were on TV so everybody could see him in the choir. Yeah. That's enough about that, huh? Get us all in the flesh talking about that. Backing out on God. They were people that were backing out on God in chapter 34. He said, uh, it's, what, it's kind of what I was referencing a while ago. Then you recently turned... 
and did what was right in my sight, every man proclaiming liberty to his neighbor, talking about the slaves, and you made a covenant before me in my house, which is called by my name. And then you turned around and profaned my name. Every one of you brought back his male and female slaves whom he had set free at liberty. Set at liberty. So he's telling them there, you, you just turned right around and did the same thing. You bargained with God. was the first thing they did. Thought, well, we'll let them go if you'll help us, God. Well, God looked like God helped them. And they took them right back. Hypocrites. Faith. Because they broke their covenant, the Lord pronounced that they would suffer the very curse they had in both. Their corpses would become food for the birds and the wild animals of the earth. And I'm going to tell you, that's pretty rough right there. When God doesn't just say, it's not, going to be, it's not just going to be hard on you, you're not going to lose a little money, you're not going to lose your job, you're not going to have a drought, the animals are going to eat you. God was pretty upset with their hypocrisy. All right. Now let's compare the inconsistencies. This is kind of, again, the hypocrisy. Compare the inconsistencies of God's people with the consistency. It's what he does in chapter 35. Jeremiah does a group called the Rechabites. The Rechabites were a tribe of nomads who had committed themselves to live a separatist lifestyle. Their group had been founded more than 200 years earlier by a man named Jonadab. I'm sorry? It may not. I'm just, I'm just prefacing something here. This goes back with the consistency. Do I not have that one on there? Consistency? No. Good. I, I wanted to throw y'all off and see if y'all would catch that. I'm glad y'all caught it. I, I missed that one on my outline, didn't I? Well, just listen then. Just listen. Write it down. Uh, you can always tell these blank people. they got to get all their blanks. For Compare the inconsistency here. Look at what, Here's a group of people. Now, I, I tell you how I see these people. They remind me of the Amish people. You'll see it as I tell you a little bit more about them. Let's, let's read just a little bit about them here in chapter uh, 35. Uh, and verses, verses 5 and 6. Let's do a couple things about them. I think it's unique here. And here's how he compared them. I got this small print Bible and very real. Then I sent before the sons of the house of the Rechabites bowls full of wine. And God told Jeremiah and him to bring, had told them to bring them in and test them. He said, You want to see somebody who's committed? Bring these Rechabites in. Let me show you what commitment is. He said, bring them in, fill bowls full of wine and cups, and then said to them, drink the wine. You know, have a party. We're providing you all a feast. And they said, we'll drink no wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father commanded us, saying, you shall drink no wine. Now are your sons forever. You shall not build a house, nor sow, nor plant a vineyard, nor have any of these but all your days you shall dwell in tents, that you may live many days in the land where you are sojourners. <coughs> Make the point they were, as it says here, they were nomads. They were a group that committed, and I don't know, I don't know why, without all the history, going back and studying it, I don't know if I think God had led them to be wanderers, to be nomads, to not put down roots. But my point being. They were a people who were committed. He tempted them with wine. He tempted them with, with several things that uh, he tested, basically, their consistency. That's on your, your worksheet there. And he put it all out there for them. He said, see if they're really committed to what they believe. His point was, we are not committed. These guys are committed. They're committed to what they believe. Does anybody tell me anything about this? Will not drink wine. Does that? What is that tie? Is, is that used anywhere else in some kind of vow? Nazarite. Nazarite vow. Nazarite vow. That's right. Nazarite vow. Who were na who, who were people that took Nazarite vows? Anybody? Samson was one. Remember that Nazarite vow? They didn't cut their hair. I accused Daniel of being one. <laughs> <laughs> Nazarite vow was a person who didn't cut their hair. It was a person who didn't drink 
wine. They they were to stay away from any kind of strong drink. And uh, it was a special group of people set aside for purpose. They set themselves aside to be holy unto the Lord. And I thought to myself, you know, we can hear all the arguments about drinking and whether you can as a Christian or shouldn't as a Christian or you can have a little bit as long as you don't get drunk. Well, when I look at the Nazarite vow in the Bible and people who took that, you take Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they're taken away into Babylon. The king brought in his wine to them. They said, no, 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 king, we don't want your wine. It's the same thing. We don't even want your meat off your table. We're going to show you. We're just going to be vegetarians and we'll be all right. But they refused to drink the king's wine. But something about a Nazarite vow, if God says there's a special group of people that when they make the Nazarite vow, one of the things I'm going to make sure they do is they stay away from any kind of alcohol. Now, you can talk about all your theology if you want to. But to me, that's a pretty clear statement. If you want to go over and above, if you want to really stand out, and you want to spend, don't drink anything, don't take anything that's going to alter your state of mind. Stay away from it. Don't take a chance. Don't even play with it. Stay away from it. And I know you can believe other things. If you want to, that's fine. You know, you may leave here tonight and say, I'm not sure what I believe about that, but you're going to leave here tonight and say, I'm pretty sure what Brother Mike believes about that. Amen? But I just believe we ought to stay away from it. I just believe it's the better part of wisdom. Nazarite vow says stay away from it. I just think there's plenty of verses that says don't mess with it when it stirs in the cup. But these were guys of these were guys of integrity. Character mattered to the Rechabites. It mattered. It didn't matter to the Jewish people. So Jeremiah talks about them as an example. They weren't to drink wine. They weren't going to live in houses. They were, they were not to be farmers. What do you think they did? How did they make a living? They lived in tents and they did what? They were herders. They were ranchers. They had cattle and sheep and goats and stuff like that. And they moved around. And most of your people who are shepherds over there now, that's how they live now. There's nomads over there now. What do they do? They put up their tents. They stay in this area for a few weeks. All the grass is gone. They pick up and they move to another area. They eat up all the grass there and they pick up and move to another area. That's how they live. And they stink. Let me just put that out there for you. If you get close to them in that part, of, if they come into town, you'll lose your appetite. They smell like the old sheep. All right. They were, that were, uh, they were to always be intense and to be nomads. That was just some things that they did to believe, to, to, to show their faith in God and what, doing what they felt God had led them to do. And he was just comparing them. I think they're a lot like the Amish people. You know, God wanted Israel to learn from the guys. These guys were consistent. You may not agree with them, but they were going to be the same tomorrow as they were today. They're not going to be one thing on Sunday and something else on Monday. Okay? Sometimes I, I'll be honest with you, I've gotten so cynical about some of this. We went and ate some crawfish last night, and I saw these young families come in there. And they, you know, we went up to Farmville and we'd never been there before to eat crawfish. Got up there, and, and it was BYOB. We heard going up, we called up there, and I said, Oh, great, bring your own Bible. And we'll have Bible study while we're there. Obviously, that's what that means. Yeah. If people start bringing their ice chests in when we got there, I said, I don't believe they got their Bibles in them ice chests. <laughs> but there were several young couples started bringing out their breaking out their beer and all that kind of stuff, and and uh, and you know I just thought to myself, I wonder how many of those folks are going to go be sitting in church in the morning. And one thing on Saturday night, there's something else on Sunday morning. Consistency. That's what God was looking for in the Jewish people of that day. Don't tell me you're one thing when you come in here worshiping. Because they were still going to the temple. They were still taking their sacrifices to God. And then they'd go home and worship their idols. Yeah. Or well, some of them would actually go down in the basement of the temple and offer incense to idols. In the basement of the temple. Some of the elders. And so God said, don't be like that. Be different. I called you to be different. All right. Chapter 36 is Isaiah's, I mean, Jeremiah's calling. Uh, God, it's about his whole process of getting Baruch to come and be his menuet, which is a, a scribe, a secretary to write down and organize all your sermon notes. And that's basically what the book of Jeremiah is. 
It is an organization of all the sermons of Jeremiah that he went out and preached in the streets to the people. That's what chapter 36, verse 4 said. Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on a scroll of a book at the instruction of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken to him. Verse 6 says, And you go therefore and read from the scroll which you have written at my instruction the words of the Lord in the hearing of the people of the Lord's house on the day of fasting. Why did he have Baruch go read it? Because he's been arrested at this point and he's in jail. The prophet's in jail. Falsely accused, but he's in jail. This happened again a little earlier in the ministry before their destruction. Some people probably think if you're a preacher and you get thrown in jail for preaching the Word, that that's just a horrible thing on your testimony. Well, I think you'd just be like Paul. I think you'd just be like Peter and some of these other guys that got arrested for preaching the Word. And I'd almost consider it a mark of honor. If somebody cared enough about what you said to try to silence you, I'd consider it an act of, of honor. Jeremiah's experiences during the fall chapters 37 through 39. His experiences during the fall. The crime of Jeremiah. Faithfulness. That's what he was accused of. Being too faithful. In chapter 37. Jeremiah is falsely accused and arrested for treason because he refused to say what the people wanted to hear. He was telling them that the Babylonians are going to come and crush us because of our sins. And what the people wanted him to say was it's going to be alright. They're not coming. Some of the false prophets were saying that. Babylonians aren't coming. They're not going to, their army's not going to come. And he said, I'm telling you, God said they're coming. And you better get your act together. In fact, several times before the fall, he gave them an, God gave them an opportunity. If you will repent, I will relent. If you will repent, I will relent. In other words, I'll take my mind. But they wouldn't do it. And so he is falsely accused and arrested for treason. Jeremiah faithfully spent time with God and gave a clear message from God to the people of Judah. As y'all know, I can't take time and read every one of these verses in these chapters, but I'm trying to get the high points. God says to them, God says to Jeremiah, spend time with me, hear me, deliver that clear message. And You remember what he told Jeremiah in chapter 1 when he called him? He said, don't look at their faces. I have to remember that sometimes as a preacher. Not because y'all's faces are not pretty. I don't mean it that way. But down through the years, sometimes you preach a certain message and some people don't want to hear it. Sometimes people don't want to hear what God says. Make them mad. And, and so he told Jeremiah, he said, sometimes you're going to be rooting up and pulling down. Well, God, I just got into the ministry because I just wanted to make people feel better about themselves. I, God, I got into the ministry because I just wanted everybody to leave feeling better and feel like you're okay and I'm okay. And I mean, I, I mean, these are things I've heard through the years. You preach too much about Jesus. You preach too much about repentance. You preach too much about sin. And, you know, we don't want to hear all that. And, and, and you just, you hear these things, folks. And, and he said, sometimes the ministry, about, sometimes before you can build, you have to tear down. Yeah. Sometimes, because you've got to build a foundation. And not that it's your job to tear down. I mean, I'll be honest with you, that's not any preacher's job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. My only job is just to preach the truth. And Amen. let the chips fall where they may. Let God deal with the rest of it. And, and that's, what, that's what a minister has to do. He has to be honest. And he has to speak the truth in love. But sometimes that truth can sting a little bit. In fact, uh, Jeremiah said when he ate that scroll, he said some of it was bitter. The conspiracy to kill Jeremiah, chapter 38. A group set out to kill Jeremiah because he had called them to surrender to the Chaldeans or, same, or the Babylonians, the same group of people. But if they stayed to fight, they would die. That's why they called it treason, because he was calling for them to surrender 
don't fight this out. If you fight it out, he says, God's telling you, you're going to die. But if you'll surrender to them, they will provide you. They'll take you back to Babylon. They're going to provide you a place to live. But you will live. You'll get to build houses and have children and marry your children. And you remember he told them, he said, go there. Build houses, plant gardens, have families. You're going to be there 70 years. So God says you can go ahead and just go back there and make a home and try to make a difference in that country, which, by the way, there was a Jewish settlement in that country for hundreds of years after that. Some of them came back to Jerusalem later on. They came back from exile. But several of them stayed there for years and years and years. In fact, some of those parts of Babylon, which were, what is Babylon? What, what was Babylon? What is it today? Turkey. Huh? It's Iran, Iraq. It's that area of Iran and Iraq over there. In fact, the Persians, which you hear talk, which came after the Babylonians, the Persians are the Iranians. But uh, a lot of this area was Iraq, well, modern day Iraq. And the and Israelites, some of them are still there today. I can't say for the last 50 years because there's been because since the Muslim rising after the uh, uh, after World War II and the peace after World War One and the peace settlement and the, all that they have began to run Christians out like uh, like uh, Constantinople which is now Istanbul I mean that was predominantly Christian and the Muslims have gone in there in the last 50 years and run all, almost all the Christians out of there the same thing's true for Iraq and places. But yeah, there were Jewish and Christian settlements inside the Iraq. In fact, when Saddam Hussein was there, they had supposedly religious freedom. But they were hated. The Jews were hated by the Muslims there. As the Muslims got stronger, the Jews and the Christians got weaker. So we're still seeing some of that today. They're running them out from everywhere. Now they're trying to take over America. Huh? Now they're trying to come over and take over our Yeah. Take over us. Now they're already taking over America. Yeah, that's a whole other story. <laughs> Jeremiah received a death sentence. He was supposed to die. They were going to take him out and they were going to kill him. He was guilty. They lowered him by the ropes into an empty cistern. But he sank deep into the mud for a slow death. There was no water in there, but it was deep, deep mud. And he sank down in that mud. And their plan was for him to struggle there till he died. But a man named Ebed Melek saved him. He went to the king, he got a, a reprieve, if you will, and he was able to have his life spared. The collapse of Jerusalem. We're almost ready to break, okay? If any of you need to go get ready for the break, you can do that right now. The collapse of Jerusalem, chapter 39. Jeremiah 39, verse 2 says, In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, <coughs> the fourth month, on the ninth day of that month, the city was penetrated. All who were still alive were at the point of starvation. They began to cannibalize those who had died. <laughs> Didn't you know what a siege, do you really know what a siege is like? This siege of Jerusalem took 18 months. It's not like they just built up their forces and they ran, them. you've seen them on TV when they're fighting and they'll bring a big trunk of a tree up there and they'll knock the big gates open and go in. It just don't happen that easy. These cities are fortified and as I said, they're built up on top of a mountain. They're built up on a tail, which is city after city after city been built. And to get to the gates, sometimes the gates may be 200 feet above where your, your army's at down here. And they have to build what's called a siege ramp. And so they take slave labor and they begin to collect stones and sand from all over to try to build this ramp so they can roll their gate smashing machine or whatever up that ramp to that door, to those big gates. And so a siege, a lot of times, it's not like people just attack from every area and they destroy the city. A lot of it is, is like uh, putting a, a barricade around a city. Many of you remember, maybe in the Civil War, you remember the Battle of Vicksburg? They put a, a siege on Vicksburg. Basically, they built a barricade around Vicksburg and they starved them to death. Yeah. People were eating rats. 
you know, they're eating anything they could find. And that's a lot of time. That's what this took 18 months. And basically it's a time of starvation. It's a time of, of uh, disease. Yeah, no toilet paper. <laughs> Coronavirus probably takes over sometime during that period. And, uh, and, and it's amazing that, that people even live over it. But by the time... I, I had a video of Masada, I was going to show you, I don't know if I have it here of the siege of Masada, the city of Masada. They thought that God would save them, surely he would never allow their great capital to fall in the hands of the enemy. They thought there'd never be any consequences for their sin. You, you may have bought into that lie. Oh, God's going to let me get away with it. I'm faking it, nobody knows it. God's going to let me get away with it. No. 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 There's a payday someday. Yeah. Look at this. This is Masada. I've visited Masada. It's built up on top of mine. It's a city that when Jerusalem fell in, in, in AD 70, that a bunch of Jews went up there and they, they stayed on this mountain tail. And, and uh, you'll see the siege ramp that they built. And then we'll take our break. It's only a couple minutes. This is what a siege looks like. Oh. Guess what? I don't have the PA system turned on, and that's not working. So you can't hear it. I'll, I'll set that up before we can play it when we come back in. But that's about the siege of Jerusalem. What it looks like. All right? Let's pray. We'll take a break and bring your food back in here. Uh, I think we're good on time tonight. In fact, we should be a little early. Let's take a half a little short. Fathers, we gather here tonight, Lord, and as we've, as we've thought about, Lord, the hypocrisy of the nation of Israel and Judah, and God, how they played one thing on the Sabbath and then turned around and did something else the rest of the week. God, may that never be us. May that be the lesson we learn from Jeremiah as he cried to their nation because of their hypocrisy, their idolatry. And they fail because of it. God, we know it weakens the Christian church these days. Hypocrisy. So Lord, teach us. Give us convictions. Fathers, we go now to fellowship and eat together. Thank you for those that prepared it. We praise you, Father, for all your goodness. Thank you for the food. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. All right, let me show you this video. This is about the siege of Jerusalem. This wasn't the one about Masada. This was a little bit about what went on in that siege. It's kind of a historical thing as it falls. Okay, listen up or somebody won't be able to hear. With the prophet Jeremiah, Jerusalem's fate was sealed. After generations of fluctuating loyalty, both spiritually and politically, the southern kingdom of Judah was about to come to the crossroads. Submission to Babylon that promised life and yet exile. Resistance to Babylon guaranteeing both death and exile. As Jeremiah would see, submission is a hard sell to human nature, even if it guarantees life. The first siege of Jerusalem by Babylon is recorded in 2 Kings 24, verses 10 through 12. It was during the short three-month reign of 18-year-old Jehoiachin, who was left to defend his father's decision to rebel against Babylon. Babylon marched into Judah determined to regain control. 2 Kings records that Jehoiachin surrendered once a siege had been laid against Jerusalem. He and 10,000 prominent Judeans were taken to Babylon as captives. Nebuchadnezzar also took all the treasures of the Lord's temple and the treasures of the king's palace, and he set up a new Judean king, Zedekiah. Politically, Judah's king Zedekiah lived in submission to Babylon only in show. He sided with a failing Egypt in a last-ditch effort to resist Babylon. But once Egypt was destroyed, Judah was alone. One by one, the fortified cities of Judah were destroyed, and Jerusalem itself was laid siege to. The general horrors of siege warfare were experienced in Jerusalem in great measure, starvation, disease, and cannibalism. The siege lasted at least a year and a half, 
and ended with the brutality of besieging soldiers that had been working to break the city walls. The city was set on fire. Zedekiah was blinded and many residents of Jerusalem slaughtered. Those who survived were exiled. The words of God's prophets had been fulfilled. Jerusalem was no more. All that was left was to hope that God would continue to fulfill his promises. <coughs> But they learned that God was going to do what he said he was going to do, whether they were ready or not. All right, we're going to start in chapter 41. Chapter 40, Jeremiah's experiences after the fall, after the destruction. He had some unique experiences with the Babylonian king. You remember, it said in the video about how Nebuchadnezzar took the, the vessels from the temple. Does anybody remember anything else about the story about those temple vessels? I love pop tests. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you used them in a, in a banquet. That's right. Who did that? Wasn't that Nebuchadnezzar? No, it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar. Belshazzar. Belshazzar. Here it was. The king that followed Nebuchadnezzar. I think he may have been the one that sometimes was referred to as Nebuchadnezzar II, but... But Belshazzar was who it was in the Bible. And uh, Belshazzar had taken the temple vessels and he had desecrated them. Uh, he had basically, it's like putting pig blood in them and stuff like that, drinking wine from them. And he had done several desecrated things to those vessels. And, and because of what he had done, that's where the hand, the finger of the hand wrote on the wall and it said, it said, what? Somebody else, what's it say? You've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And basically he put a scale up there and he said, you've been weighed and you're guilty. And you're coming. And he said, tonight your kingdom will be taken from you. And that was the night that the Medes and the Persians came in. They stopped the Euphrates River which flowed under the wall of Babylon and they marched in right under the wall in the dry riverbed where the Euphrates was. Uh, maybe it wasn't totally dry, but they marched right in under the wall. They couldn't take Babylon on their own, but uh, they drive, they diverted the river and walked right in under the wall in the riverbed and uh, destroyed it that night because they were too busy partying and doing their own thing and not taking care of business the way they should have. And so, uh, but yeah, those vessels lived on. In fact, those vessels would got and Jeremiah had told them that those vessels would be brought back to Jerusalem one day and they'd be used in the temple and for sacrifices again. So that had been a, another future prophecy. Jeremiah's experiences. Jeremiah is the called out by the king in chapter 41. He's called out in a good way by, by the king of Babylon. Let me get turned over there. All right. In verses 2 and 3, when Nebuchadnezzar, which was the guy who was basically made the governor for this area that was taken over, discovered Jeremiah. He was, he was, kind of, he was the authoritarian in that area for the Babylonians, but it's not Nebuchadnezzar there. He, he said he discovered Jeremiah among the captives, and he showed a surprising familiarity with his preaching. Look what verses 2 and 3 says. It says, Then Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and the ten men who were with him, arose and struck Gedaliah, the son of Ahakam, the son of Shephan. Am I in the right chapter? No, you're 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. Yeah. Maybe it is in 40. I'm reading the wrong one. I'm sorry. I, I got 40 on this, 41 on the screen. I'm sorry. Look at verse 2. Uh, it says in verse 2, And the captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said to him, The Lord your God has pronounced this doom on this place. Now the Lord... I'm sorry. Verses 2 and 3 is right in chapter 41. I just... Uh, it's just going through all them hard names. I'm, just, I'm trying to find an excuse and I have to pronounce all of them. Verse 4, goes on to verse 4, says, It happened the second day after he killed Gedaliah, 
when if no one knew it, that certain men came from Shechem, from Shiloh, from Samaria, 80 men with their beard shaved and their clothes torn, having cut themselves. And if you read through this whole chapter here, what it's talking about is when uh, Jeremiah was raised out, he, he was pointed out as a man of integrity that, uh, that the king was impressed with him as a person. Look at a couple of things I put on here. Jeremiah was given his freedom to go to Babylon to live in the king's palace or to stay in Judah. He was given that opportunity. Now, what the king or what the governor, if you will, uh, said was, I want you to come and move in uh, in my palace area here, and because he was, why do you think Jeremiah's messages were more impressive to the Babylonians than they were to the Judeans? Because the Babylonians were winning. Babylonians were winning. Jeremiah was saying things that they liked. You know, you're going to die. You're, these guys are going to whip you. But I think they also liked his courage. I think they were impressed with the man's courage who stood for what he knew God wanted him to say. And they were impressed with that. And just like, it kind of reminds you of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember the king brought those guys in because of their wisdom? And they gave him counsel. They gave the king counsel. And that's what he was offering Jeremiah. Was to come live in his area. Be a man that he looked to for wisdom and for counsel. You at least have to admire the Babylonians for, for that mindset of always looking for wise people and looking for courageous people. And so he told him, he said, you can come live with me, man. All your meals will be taken care of. He'll give you a house to live in. And uh, you'll be there where I respect you. He was a man respected. And, but he, he also told him, he said, but if you want, you can go free. I'm not going to hold you as a captive, as a slave. Jeremiah, given that choice, he said, I'm going to stay with my people. I'm going to stay with the people. I'm not going to go. He chose to stay in Judah because he loved the land and he loved the people. Even though he'd been preaching a hard message to him, he loved the people. And he, you know, when you deliver a hard message, it's not because you don't love people, it's because you do love people. And he loved the land of Judah and Israel. Because it was God's land. The Bible says the land of Israel is the apple of God's eye. And Je Jeremiah felt that way about that. In chapter 42, the crushed people finally seek God. They finally began to seek after God. How deep was their, how deep was their love for God? In chapter 42, he said to Jeremiah, and said to Jeremiah the prophet, Please let our petition be acceptable to you and pray for us to the Lord your God for all this remnant since we are left but a few of many, as you can see. So after all this judgment, there was a remnant left in Judah. Most of them had been taken away in exile. Some had stayed, been allowed to stay in Judah. That the Lord your God may show us the way in which we should walk and the thing we should do. Isn't it amazing that the Jewish people talk to Jeremiah about your God instead of our God? They had been so long away from God, so unfaithful to God, that it's almost like God was somebody that they needed to get to know again. And that was true. They didn't even know God anymore. They didn't know God's heart. They didn't know God's will. They didn't know God's ways. They sought their own ways. They sought their own gods. And here, but isn't it sad? Isn't it sad that it took this crushing of the people of Judah to get their attention? Has God ever had to get your attention? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of things get our attention. <coughs> One time, Samson took two old foxes and he tied their tails together and set them on fire and sent them out through the wheat fields. Burn everything up. 
He had one intention. For God to get their attention. He wanted to get their attention. And I heard a preacher preach a sermon one time. He says, God, is God having to burn your barley fields? What's it going to take to get our attention? Can the message, will we hear God's message? Or is God going to have to hit us in the head with a two-fold? Yeah, or COVID-19, they'll say it. You know, sometimes the thing that gets your attention when you hear them jail doors slam behind you. That gets a lot of people's attention, doesn't it? Yep. Clang. Yeah. It would me. It would me. I'd be crying. I want my mom. Yeah. I had to ask my mama because she'd come. My wife wouldn't come. But it's sometimes it crushes us. We have to be just crushed before we'll look up to God. And that's a, that's a silly side of humanity. We can learn things the easy way, or we wind up learn, having to learn things the hard way. You ever have kids like that? You may have one kid that, I mean, you just about look at them and they'll straighten up their act. The other one? You kind of wear them out to get their attention. That's scary. <laughs> That's the way Gary was. That's the way Gary was. Hey, me, all you got to do is look at me out there. Danny, why don't you just be quiet? Let me go to the authority. Hey, <laughs> you got three and they're all different, weren't they? But sometimes we don't listen. We're silly and we have to be crushed before we let God have his way in our life. Yeah, well, that's because she's a girl. <laughs> if Mama just knew, right, Dave? If she just knew, everything. The council. <laughs> what was the council of Jeremiah to trust Judeans? He said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. To whom you sent me to present your petition before him. In other words, they said, go talk to God for us. Okay. If you will still remain in this land. These are the ones who are still in Judah. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is the ones that, that have been taken captive. They were on their way or they were already in, in Babylon. If you will still remain in this land. Remember God told them they were going to stay there 70 years. Don't fight it. Then I will build you and not pull you down. Remember that was Jeremiah's message in the very beginning. God told him, you're going to pull down. He says, I will build you and not pull you down. I will plant you and not pluck you up. That was another thing he told him in Jeremiah chapter 1. He says, you're going to tear down and you're going to build up. That's part of your ministry, Jeremiah. So he's telling them here, if you'll stay here where God has sent you for your 70 years, we're going to go through this process of healing. For I relent. I will relent concerning the disaster that I have brought upon you. In other words, it won't be as tough. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Do not be afraid of him, says the Lord, for I am with you to save you, to deliver you from his hand. In other words... Sometimes God says that He, you know, how do I say this? Sometimes our biggest issue might be not just how we deal with the world, but how we deal with God. The Bible says we ought to have a fear. There ought to be an awesome respect for God. You know, in fact, Jesus made this statement. He said, don't fear the people who can destroy your body. Fear the God who can destroy your body and your soul in hell. That's the one you ought to be in respect of. And that's what he's telling them here. Now, he's, Babylon's not your, your biggest worry. Your biggest worry is what you do to me. But that was the counsel of Jeremiah to the people of Judah. Now, how deep, I wonder, was their commitment? Well, chapter 43 shows us how really committed they were. They wanted Jeremiah to go plead to the Lord and see if they could get out of this Babylonian captivity. But in chapter 43, when Jeremiah says, settle down, go through the process, pay your 70 years back to God, and then we'll go from there. 
The people said in chapter 43, verse 2, that Azariah, the son of Hashiah, Hashiah, Jehoiada, the son of Kareah, and all the proud men spoke, saying to Jeremiah, You speak falsely. The Lord our God has not sent you to say, Do not go to Egypt to dwell there. Because see, that's what they were wanting to do. They were wanting to, to sneak out of Babylon. You have to understand, I mean, they're not, they're not in a prison wall. There's not barbed wire around them. I mean, they're just taken away there to live in exile. So they were going to slip out of, of Babylon and go to Egypt. Prior to the fall, the king of, of, of uh, Judah had made a pact with the kings of Egypt, the pharaohs of Egypt. And the pharaohs of Egypt said, come down here and we'll take care of you. We won't treat you like Babylon. And Jeremiah told him, he said, no, God told you to stay in Babylon. <coughs> Don't leave here and go to Egypt. So they said, talk to God about what we should do. Well, God said, you're going to stay here in Judah. And you'll be all right if you stay here. They said, you're a liar. God didn't say that. You're a liar. Same old people that they've always been. Same thing that got them destroyed by the Babylonians. <coughs> well, we don't like God's way. Isn't the issue sometimes we just don't like God's way of doing things? Yeah. Now, come on. Y'all sit there and act all spiritual, yeah. okay? You're either spiritual or asleep right now. Sometimes God's got a way of doing things that's different from our way of doing things. Yeah, a lot of times he's going to Sometimes God says, man, that dude slapped you? Man, reach over and hug him back. I'm like, what? That don't make sense. Man, slap me. No, he said, turn the other cheek, let him slap the other cheek. Hmm. Love your enemies. Now, that's God's way of doing stuff. That ain't my way of doing stuff. Amen? That's not the human way of doing stuff. But that's God's way of doing stuff. How about, how about your wife left you, had an affair, and God says to you, don't worry about that, forgive her, love her, work through that. And you're saying, you're out of your mind. She's out of here. God's way is not always like our way, is it? Usually never. Usually never. Right. Or what if God says, wait on me? How many of you like waiting on God? You like waiting on God to work it out God's way. Because God's got a certain way. He wants to work it out. But how many times do we get ahead of God? <laughs> like Abraham. God was going to give him a descendants. Seashore. You know, Sarah's going to have a child. Well, I ain't got time to wait on Sarah. She's an old woman. I'm going to take this little young handmaid out here and we'll have some children through that. He tried to shortcut God's way of doing things. Got punished for it too. And to this day, to this day, the Jews are still paying for that decision. Because the handmaid's children became the Arabs, the Muslims. And they hate the Jews. That's two brothers. That's two, that's family fighting. How many times do we get ahead of God? And we don't like God's way of doing things. That's exactly where these guys were. Well, God's will and our will is not exactly the same thing, you know. And that's the whole problem. They didn't, they didn't honor the word that God gave Jeremiah. They wanted the easy way. They wanted the quick way. They wanted the way that didn't require them to stay in, in Babylon for 70 years. So they were looking for a shortcut. Alright? Verse 7 says, So they went to the land of Egypt. God just told them don't do it. For they did not obey the voice of the Lord. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but has anybody in here ever not obeyed the voice of the Lord? How about just something you're doing? You don't obey the voice of the Lord. It's not like, okay, God said don't rob that bank, but you robbed that bank anyway. Yeah, that's obey this obeying the voice of the Lord. But how about God just told you to be holy in some area and you said, I ain't going to do that. You just reject the holiness of God and you reject obeying God and you reject obeying your parents. Or you reject uh, uh, just you know witnessing to somebody God wants you to witness to. That's just like these guys. That's just like them. He said, "I don't care what God's will is. I'm into my will right now. I don't. I don't care what the what God wants me to do. I want to do what I want to do. 
I'm going to smoke pot. I'm going to I'm going to run them the wild life. I'm going to go with all my drunk buddies at their parties. I don't care what God's voice says. I'm going to do what I want to do. Hello? Are y'all with me? We have to deal with that, don't we? What is the voice of the Lord to you today? In your life today, what is God saying to you today that you need to deal with God about? Jeremiah dealt with the same thing. The calamity that would fall on them and Egypt because of this Egypt participation in this rebellion. Chapter 43, verse 10. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will send and bring Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. Did you see that? Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon... A pagan, not Jewish, a heathen, my servant. God can use a tool for anybody. There were people in the Bible, King Cyrus in the Bible, and, and several others. Now, we talked about this one Wednesday night, and you know, we look at President Trump and we say, well, God, he don't he sure hadn't lived a very godly life. He hadn't done this or he hadn't done that, and he's got foul language and he's got a bad past and, and all this kind of stuff. But I'm gonna tell you, when God wants to do something, he can take anybody and make a servant out of them beyond their abilities. And it may just be that God has is using him as a, 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 a tool to try to right our nation. That's right. To try to save America. That's right. I don't like a lot of things about the guy, but I like a lot, most of the decisions he's made. Yeah. He can be somebody who's just a tool of God beyond his character. Right. Yeah. And, and he will set his throne, speaking of Babylon, he'll set his throne above the stones that I've hidden, that I've hidden. If you read this story, he told them along the way, when you go into the city, when you go in down there, he said, about, pick up a bunch of stones and pile them up by the gate. They didn't know why. I think they dug a hole and they put them in that hole. Said, make a pile of them there. And they didn't know why Jeremiah told them to do that. And later on he said, that pile of stones you piled up right there, Nebuchadnezzar's going to come in there and set his throne on that pile of stones right there by Egypt because he's going to whip you off the table. Mm -hmm. And he will spread his royal pavilion over those stones. In other words, they were just fixing to go in and conquer Egypt. Why? What was Egypt's biggest sin right now? Trying to help God's people when Egypt wanted them. They were not listening to God either. And it really, the, 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 the calamity really wasn't Egypt's fault. Egypt, I think, was just trying to have a treaty with somebody. God was after the Jews. He was after His people. Egypt just got caught up in the wrong that was being done. I believe. <laughs> Jeremiah 3, 43, 12 says, And I will kindle a fire in the house of the gods of Egypt, and he shall burn them and carry them away captive. Don't try to help people disobey God. Maybe that's a good lesson to learn. The catastrophic proclamation against all Jews in Egypt for worshiping the fertility goddesses Ishtar or Ashtar, however it's it's spelt both different ways at times. The queens of heaven. How many of you have ever heard that phrase, the queen of heaven? It's really just queen, not queens. Is anybody today called the queen of heaven? Mother of God? Pray to? Mary. Mary, prayed to, called the Queen of Heaven, came right out of the, the the Madonna, the mother and child. You've seen anybody seen a Madonna? I ain't talking about the singer now. <laughs> Madonna is uh, is the mother of heaven and her male child sitting on her lap. Picture of Jesus sitting on the lap, Mary his mother. Anyway, there's some stuff there. That's a whole other study. 
In Jeremiah chapter 44, verses 25 and 26, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, You and your wives have spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hands, saying, We will surely keep our vows that we have made to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings to her. <coughs> At least this is idolatry. It's, it's worship of the some of the Egyptian gods. At least they are worth. If you don't even tie it into anything today, it's more their idolatry. You will surely keep your vows and perform your vows. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, all Judah, who dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, says the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, The Lord God lives. God takes serious idolatry, folks. Amen. Any kind of cut out, anything you buy, I mean, it's one of the Ten Commandments. I mean, anything that you bow before in worship, anything you salute, God says we're not to have images that we worship. Which, watch this. This is a Catholic University professor. Many people wonder why do we pray to Mary at all? Why don't we just give our faith to Jesus? Now, we ask one another to pray for one another frequently, right? Because we know that somebody else's prayers can help you. Well, how much more can the prayers of the mother of Christ, who is the Queen of Heaven, whom Elizabeth called the mother of my Lord, how much more can her prayers be effective for us? Because she is perfectly united with Christ, body and soul, in heaven. She knows his heart better than any of us do. She knew his heart at the wedding at Cana, enough to ask him for a miracle. And her faith brought about that miracle. Her faith can still bring about miracles in our lives that are performed by the Lord, but at her request. Thank you, Jesus. What do you think about that? What do you think about that? We need to pray and go to the Queen. And we can't go directly to God. We need to go to the Queen of Heaven and get her to go to God for us. But I'm saying to you, idolatry gets built into forms of religion. And don't think it doesn't. Now I could stand up here and say, I could just stand up here and ignore all this stuff. I can ignore all this, so I'm not going to say that because somebody's going to say I'm being ugly. But we need to know the truth that's out there. Right. Yeah. Right. We need to know what's out there. We need to know that idolatry builds its way into religions of today. It builds its way into Christianity. We have to be very, very cautious. Go back what? and study it sometime. Huh? Well, yes, sir. The way I see it is uh, the whole New Testament preaches Jesus Christ. Yeah. The whole New Testament. They tell about Mary being the mother and, and having Jesus, but they, they stop there. They don't go no further to praise her for anything else. They praise Jesus Christ from that point, that point on. Yeah. So they don't yeah. carry on with, with the mother. I guess all I'm yeah. telling you is a lot of this, I mean, Jeremiah dealt with this. Jeremiah was dealing with this in his day. We deal with it today. We don't know we deal with it a lot of times. But Jeremiah dealt with it in his day because there were people worshiping the wrong things. There were people worshiping the wrong people. There were, and, and there was this mentality of Mother God. It was dealing with Isis and Or Isis and the Greek mythology and then Egyptian mythology, idolatry. And the Jews had bought into that. That's all I'm saying to you. The Jews had bought into that. And I'm saying to you, God says there's a way to do some things and there's a way not to do some things. And this is a way that God said, don't do it that way. You, when Jesus died on that cross, listen, there was nobody else between you and God. The only one that you're to go to, the only one that's supposed to make intercession for you is Jesus. He prays for you. You pray to Him. You pray in His name, He said. There's nothing in the Bible about praying in Mary's name. Nothing about that. 
That's a man-made religion. Well, uh, there are some there are some places in Rome where they've got they've got crosses and they've got Jesus crucified on the front and Mary crucified on the back. Really? Yes, sir. It says she paid for your sins on that cross just like Jesus did. Wow. I don't know how. So I'm just telling you, there is religion that can look. It can sound Christian. But you've got to look at all of it. You've got to look at the details. What are they telling you? How do you get God? Any religion that tells you you've got to go through some other, some other way to get to God is not a God. There's nobody you have to go through to get to God. That's why the veil was torn in the temple when Jesus died on that cross. No more need for a priest. No more need for somebody to talk to God for you. God wants to talk to you. All right, let's let's look at the last one. Jeremiah's prophecies to the Gentile nations around them, and this is what chapters forty-six through fifty-one are about. About the nations around them in the midst of this war and this being taken in exile. I'm not going to say a whole lot about this because it's just it's repetitive to different nations. Babylon was a tool of God. Just like it said a while ago about Nebuchadnezzar, he was God's servant. He was a pagan. But for a time, he was God's servant. And at the end of this, you're going to see, he says, just like Nebuchadnezzar was my tool, at the end of this, he says, but there's going to come a time when I finish using him, I'm going to bring him down. I'm going to bring Babylon down. But God, just Babylon was a tool of God, but now he is consumed Babylon's being going to be consumed because of her sins. Jeremiah 51. I just went on to the end of that section. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon. Now they've gone from being a tool to being the object of God's wrath. I will raise up against Babylon, against those who dwell in Leb Kami, a destroying wind. And I will send winnowers to Babylon who shall winnow her and empty her land, for in the day of doom they shall be against all around. Against her all around. Who did I say a while ago was going to take down Babylon? God. Yeah, but God would use another tool. A different tool. Persia. Medio, Medio Persia is how it's said. And that's Iran. Basically, it's Iran. We're going to bring down Iraq. That's basically what it was in that day. All right, God clarifies who's in charge and determines nations and their existence. Jeremiah 51. He has made the earth by His power. He has established the world by His wisdom and stretched out the heavens by His understanding. That's God right there, folks. When He utters His voice, there's a multitude of waters in the heavens. Scientists or people for years doubted God because of comments like that. Now we understand there is a multitude of waters in the heavens. And it turns into rain. <laughs> we, we understand that. It comes from the heavens, the clouds. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. What's that talking about? The water cycle. Comes down and evaporates back up to the clouds. It falls down and evaporates back up to the clouds. That's God. Jeremiah's talking about that before we knew anything really about uh, hydrodynamics and all the, the uh, hydrology. So he makes lightning. He said he makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. What's that saying? What's Jeremiah saying? Let me clarify to you who God is. Let me clarify to you that if you think you can stand, if your nation can stand against God, let me clarify to you who He is. He started it all. It continues because of Him. You remember when uh, when there were, I forget which army it was, was coming after uh, some of the, the Jews as they were escaping, and the one that they broke the stake through his head, um, but but they came against him. Remember, and they had all the chariots. They had like 800 chariots of iron, and the Jews didn't have anything to fight against them. But they defeated them. You know why? It says because the rains from heaven, it's like God put them in the midst of a tornado. And all those chariots got stuck in the mud, and they thought they were so strong, but you take a chariot and you stick it in the mud, you ain't got but, uh, you ain't got but one guy fighting. 
And you got people just swarming him from everywhere. And the man, because, and it said, the Bible literally says, God fought against them from the heavens. Mm -hmm. I mean, God controlled the winds and the rains, folks. And He can bring about whatever He needs to bring about. So if you think you can escape God or you're more powerful than God, Jeremiah reminds these nations around him that God's going to be and have the final say so. Right. And then Babylon is consumed by the Medes, the Persians, the Iranians, as I said a while ago, uh, because of being inattentive and careless. Jeremiah 51 says, Prepare against her the nations with the kings of, of the Medes, its governors and all its rulers, all the land of his dominion. The land will tremble in sorrow, for every purpose of the Lord shall be performed against Babylon to make the land of Babylon a desolation without inhabitants. You go back and read the book of Daniel and, and book of Kings and other places where you can read about this. Daniel talks about it a whole lot. Uh, thought maybe sometime we might do a study on the book of Daniel. It's a good, a good study. Here my 5130. The mighty men of Babylon have ceased fighting. They have remained in their stronghold. They might have failed. They became like women. I didn't say that. God said it. I don't want to hear it. They have burned her dwelling places. The bars of her gates are broken. What do you think this is talking about? This is what we were talking about a while ago with Belshazzar. This is what happened right here. They're having a party. They're not on their walls. They're not defending the city. They started having drunken parties all through Babylon. And they're not attentive to the enemy. And they didn't realize that down the road a ways... The, the uh, Medio Persians had been diverting the Euphrates River where it wouldn't flow under the city walls in Babylon anymore. And all of a sudden, when they made that final diversion of that city, it left a big old hole under the wall. Nobody's on the, on the ball. Nobody's keeping up with what's going on. And the Medes walked right in under the walls of Babylon and conquered the city. Why? Babylon was not attended. Babylon had and taking the things from Israel and had desecrated them. And I believe God, that's part of why God judged them because of what they did. The tragic collapse of Jerusalem, chapter 52, the end of the book. Then it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it, and they built a siege wall against it all around. So the city was besieged until the eleventh year. Of King Zedekiah. Seventeen was consumed. Oh, that's what? Oh, I got one on there twice, don't I? Sixteen and seventeen were the same. I don't know how I double that. That's not right, but I, it's on there. Right. All right. Go watch this. This, this is that Masada thing I showed you a while ago before we go. That was part of the Roman encampment while they had their siege. That's the siege wall, right, the siege right there. They built this ramp to get their rams up there to break into the city. Can you imagine having to build that out in that desert? No machinery. No machinery. Man. Now it's been up on that. The day when you graduate from your military academy in Israel, they go there and they they're stating because what happened when they broke in there, when they finally broke in to all those who were there in Masada, they had committed suicide. They killed themselves. Instead of being taken by the Romans, they said they'd rather die. And today when you graduate in the Israeli military, they take you up on that mountain. They make a vow. Never again. Never again will another country do to us what the Romans did.
go to Israel, you have to see that. It's an awesome place. picture, I think, of some of the things that he faced in his day, and a lot of it relates to us today. The hypocrisy and whether or not we actually willing to listen to God, and, and then what God can do if we don't listen to God. Exactly. I'm telling you, America's had some of those times like in World War II. Right? We could all have been speaking German if we wouldn't have. God had not interacted. There's some great miracles that happened in World War II. For example, the Battle of Midway and several others that just like God had to have had a hand in that or that wouldn't happen. There were just some miraculous things that happened. And so God has spared us. Maybe now He's giving us another chance. I don't know. It's, it's going to be, we've got a long way back. Let's stand and we'll be dismissed. <laughs> Thank you.